Well, welcome everyone, and welcome to the Auckland Astronomical Society's April's Practical Astronomy Session. Great to have you joining us uh, this evening, uh, wherever you are in the world. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Andrew Buckingham. Um, I'm a long-term member of the Auckland National Society, and also I run Astrons. Uh, Astrons is the company that the society is, uh, owns, and Astrons sells um, telescopes, uh, binoculars, astronomy equipment um, all around New Zealand. Um, and that's why tonight I'm broadcasting from the uh, Astrons showroom. So myself, uh, I'm a visual observer, and I enjoy using binoculars for observing the night sky. So tonight's talk is all about binoculars. What I want to do is uh, take a look at some of the different types of binoculars, explain what all the features and numbers and technical terms mean, um, and give you some sort of idea of what to look for when you're purchasing binoculars. Um, lastly, uh, we'll I'll take a bit of a look in the sky. We'll do a virtual look in the sky uh, at some of the sort of objects I often look at in binoculars. Some of are great for viewing. Uh, and um, we'll go from there. Um, as this is a practical astronomy session, I didn't want to overload and bombard you with just a straight PowerPoint type presentation. So instead, this is aimed to be as much as possible a more hands on uh, sort of look at binoculars uh, as we can do virtually. Uh, I fully encourage you to ask questions. You can, you can do that through the uh, live chat window on the side. Um, and uh, Steve Henley, our Creative Instruments, is uh, online with me. He can help us answer questions as well. Uh, since um, we are in the Astron showroom, uh, at the end of the session, we'll have time also to answer any general questions on astronomy equipment. If you want to have a look at something or have any general equipment questions, um, please feel free to ask. So let's head into binoculars. So what are binoculars good for? Uh, basically, so binoculars are basically two telescopes mounted side by side and aligned um, to point at the same object. Uh, the advantage of binoculars is that they see a low magnification and a wide field of view. So it's a good way of exploring the night sky and learning the night sky. You get to see the big picture. So you may not resolve the sort of objects in the sort of detail um, that you'll see in a telescope, uh, but you'll be surprised how much you can see in a basic pair of binoculars, even some small handheld ones. Uh, they're fantastic for viewing clusters, um, great for even comet hunting, um, and kind of um, and you know, browsing away around the sky. Um, while for this talk, we'll focus on uh, astronomical viewing, and look at the night sky, binoculars are also great for terrestrial viewing, such as looking at the view, say the boats on the harbor, or for bird watching and things like that. So whereas most telescopes uh, show an inverted image, so everything is upside down, uh, binoculars actually show the image the correct way up, uh, which makes them perfect for that dual use of night sky and terrestrial viewing. Uh, because of the low magnification, uh, the thing that binoculars are generally not so good at is looking at planets. Uh, telescope will generally exceed the view there. So let's take a look at some, start off by looking at the uh, types of uh, binoculars. Uh, and so today, modern ways and the modern binoculars, there are two um, basic types and they're prism based. So let's take a look at that. So uh, first of all, there's the roof prism binoculars. Uh, the, uh, you'll see that on the, this picture here that the roof prism binoculars have a flat top. Uh, they're often lighter and more compact. However, by the nature of their design, they transmit about 12 to 15 percent less light. Um, and the other thing is they have much tighter manufacturing tolerances. Uh, forgetting the lenses and the prisms right. And so they're not easy to adjust. Um, this generally makes them uh, more expensive uh, and less flexible. Um, and this makes roof prisms less suitable for astronomy. 
So tonight, I'm not going to focus on the roof prism so much. The other type is um, borrowed prisms, monoculars. And these are much more common and uh, available in a much larger range of sizes. Uh, um, so you see an example of uh, a pair of those here. So um, with uh, uh, pyro prism binoculars, you'll see from the kind of technical diagram that the uh, objective lens is offset from the uh, eyepieces. So a little, little bit wider, a little bit bigger. Uh, and you'll see the light comes through uh, from the objective lens through the prism system and it gets bent and flexed through the system uh, and comes out the eyepiece. Uh, by bending the light path through the prism system, uh, this makes the focal length of the binocular actually longer than the uh, physical body of the binocular. And so tonight I'm going to focus um, the talk about more focusing on the Poro prism binoculars as they're more suitable for um, astronomy purposes and more common. So not all binoculars are created equal. And um, so let's look at some of the features and the terms used binoculars to understand a little, a little bit more about them. Firstly, we're going to look at some numbers. So binoculars are normally described uh, by two numbers such as you'll hear 7 by 50, 10 by 50, uh, as a description of how you, how you size them. So the first number is the magnification, and this is controlled by the eyepiece. On most binoculars, uh, the eyepieces are fixed. So magnification is fixed, but it's not changeable. Uh, the second number is the aperture or dynamet the diameter of the objective or front lens. This is the light collecting power of the, of the binoculars. Uh, the size and the quality of that lens will determine how much detail you will see in your view. Uh, it's so, so a bigger aperture, just like the telescope, a bigger aperture will let you see more detail in an object. So we have a look here. We've got a pair of, these are a small pair of 10 by 50 binoculars. They have a, uh, the eyepiece at the end give a 10 times magnification and the lenses at the front, are, the objective lenses, are 50 millimetres in diameter. Uh, behind me on the tripod, this side here, uh, is a pair of um, 20 by 80 binoculars. So they have a 20 times magnification in the eyepieces and 80 mil of aperture in the lenses or light collecting power. Um, note about magnification. Magnification is not always helpful. Um, and that's one of the things I like about binoculars, they are often low magnification. When you magnify something, you're not um, making it better, you're just making the same image bigger. Um, what it means is you're also magnifying all the atmospheric disturbances, uh, and you look at a smaller field of view. And of course, if you're holding the binoculars by hand, any shaking in your hands, vibrations, is also magnified. Uh, so, uh, yeah, big pair of binoculars, you have to start tripod mounting. Uh, so, so, magnification is not always helpful. It's the aperture lenses that let you see the detail. Uh, now, while smaller binoculars, like the uh, 10 by 50s here, uh, can be um, handheld, that's an option for tripod mounting as well, putting a camera tripod. For the big binoculars, so here I have a big pair of these are. Uh, um, 25 by 100 binoculars, so 25 times medication on the eyepieces and 100 mil lenses at the front of the aperture. So basically, the two small telescopes side by side. Uh, and uh, with these ones, they weigh about four and a half kilos. Uh, so you can see there's no real way you can hold these stable um, without the assistance of a tripod. Uh, there are some image stabilized binoculars available. And these generally use uh, gyroscopes to dampen the effect of the movement. However, uh, this causes the binoculars to be heavier because it's more in the binoculars and, of course, a lot more expensive. And as a general rule, the image quality is not as good as non-stabilised binoculars. As you will have seen in the diagrams, uh, prisms 
are an important part of the binoculars. Um, they make the optical system work, uh, we bounce the light around, extending that light path out, um, but they also mean we can keep the binoculars compact. Uh, and as I mentioned, not all binoculars are created equal. Uh, so uh, a imp important part that um, many people are unaware of is that um, many, most binoculars on the market, in many binoculars, uh, have undersized prisms inside. The uh, undersized prisms, uh, they make it mean they can make the binoculars lighter, uh, easier to manufacture, which means they're cheaper to manufacture. Uh, uh, but what that also means is that the effective aperture of the binoculars is not the physical aperture of the lenses. In fact, the effective aperture could be uh, 20 to 10 to 20 percent less than the physical aperture of the lenses. Uh, so um, yeah, what's happening is the outer part of the lenses is not actually being used at all by binoculars. Uh, this means they can be manufactured uh, uh, cheaper and easier, you know, less accurately. Uh, to make full aperture prisms and binoculars, um, it just takes more effort and more cost uh, by the manufacturers to get that right. Uh, so always check on this because it will make a noticeable difference uh, in your binoculars and the view you get. Um, so with the aperture being reduced, you will see less detail. Uh, so uh, like the big binoculars here, they have these particular ones, uh, full aperture, you'll see all 100 mil of the lens will be used. Uh, but in a uh, inferior pair, it might only be 88 mil of the, uh, of the aperture is actually being used by the prisms. Uh, so always check on that. So uh, as I said, aperture is the most important thing. So let's look at so the, um, the lenses themselves uh, and then the glass you're looking through. So uh, binoculars are commonly uh, made, there's two different types of glass they use to make uh, binoculars. Either they use what's called BK7 glass uh, or they use BAK4, BAK is BAK4 uh, glass. Um, the BAK4 glass is more expensive, uh, but it's a better quality and it's better transmission rates. Um, so it tends to be the cheaper binoculars on the market are made from the BK7 glass, um, and but the back four will give a, a you know, slightly better image. Uh, of course, it costs a little bit more. On the on the surfaces of the lenses and all your optical surfaces, they use uh, anti-reflective coatings. These are used to improve the image, um, stop you know, stop reflections, um, better transmission, um, and these can be found in different sort of grades and levels, and so often confusing uh, because uh, you can, um, you know, what do all the terms mean? So you often hear that you know, different grades, you know, different terms used is not coated, could be just coated optics, could be fully coated optics, uh, could be multi-coated optics, or fully multi-coated optics. And uh, what I recommend is, is always go for something that's fully multi-coated. So looking for fully multi-coated optics. This means that all of the air to glass surfaces have multiple anti-reflective coatings on them, applied to them. Uh, and, and that's gonna give you the, you know, the best anti-reflection properties. Um, you'll get um, uh, some binoculars just slightly coated, and it will just mean one surface has one coating on it, um, but it'll always degrade the, um, the view you're gonna see. And then you also see some um, uh, cheap binoculars, it's often like toy binoculars, that had different colored uh, coatings. I've seen like amber colored ones that look like um, you know, amber colored sunglasses uh, and um, they get hor horrible images through them. I'm not sure how well you can see here, but if you're able to see into the um, binoculars that way, you might notice the, or even we'll try with a, a slightly larger pair, you might be able to see that there is a slight greeny uh, blue tint um, in the lenses. And that is the optical coatings. Actually, I think you see that angle. Uh, that's the coatings that um, the, uh, that they're putting onto the lenses uh, to make it work, and those coatings go right through to the eyepieces as well. Um, uh, they use the same sort of coatings for telescope eyepieces to uh, so do the same sort of uh, 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 purpose. Uh, something that crops up is another thing to look for is chromatic aberration. So all binoculars, in fact, all lens-based 
um, optical systems will have chromatic aberration. Um, chromatic aberration is caused because um, as light goes through a lens um, and the prisms, but mainly for the lenses, uh, all the parts or frequencies of the light don't bend at quite the same angle. Um, it's a, only a fraction, a tiny amount, but it's enough. And what it does is it causes color fringing. Uh, so when you look at a bright object through the binoculars, say looking at a full moon uh, or looking at out in a bright sunny day, um, what you might see is you might see on the one side of the object is a kind of bluey green fringe uh, and on the other side is a, is a red orange fringe and that's the light separating and not uh, merging back properly. They're focusing the different frequencies of light are focusing at slightly different points. So as I mentioned, all lens-based systems will have it, but what the, the degree of aberration can be minimized. Um, and that's minimized by using good quality lenses and good quality optical coatings. Um, and even the extent with some of the large binoculars, they can use uh, multi-lens systems, such as doublet designs or triplet designs uh, to counteract the aberrations or reduce the aberrations. Um, so be very cautious of that. You might have a something that sounds like a cheap pair of binoculars, but if they have cheap quality lenses on for it's not good quality lenses, not well shaped lenses, um, it can be a very disappointing view because everything you look at will have color fringes on it. Um, and it's not what you want, especially if you're looking at the sky. Um, so uh, for um, the issue is uh, focusing. So Focusing for uh, binoculars, um, they can either have a central focus mechanism or a um, focus on each eyepiece separately. So we're looking before our little 10 by 50 binoculars here. You can see that uh, at the top, there's a central focus mechanism, um, just rolls on the finger that way, and it moves the two eyepieces in and out to focus together. Uh, all, nice, all nice and handy, but the two eyepieces do move together and um, it's a whole mechanism for that. Um, in this particular binoculars, the, actually the right eye has a separate adjustment, a diopter adjustment, uh, so you can adjust the right eye separately. So this is good for people that have do have eyes that are slightly different. Uh, for example, you might have astigmatism in one of your eyes, um, or it's been eyes slightly different. Uh, so uh, for that, so for the little binoculars in that way. Uh, some of the, the large binoculars can have individual focus eyepieces. So you can take the big ones here, and you can see that uh, each eyepiece can actually focus separately. Uh, and this is perfect for people that want to get, ha have their eyes either slightly different, want to get a, a separate view for each eye, um, and, um, and it does make it a little bit easier for people like me that wear glasses uh, to um, get your focus right. Uh, and yeah, so if you have different eyes, you can focus individually for yourself. Uh, the uh, key part is uh, with binoculars is the interpupil distance. So, so uh, first of all, when you're looking at focusing, uh, it can be a bit of a personal preference of which type you want, the individual or the central focus. Um, but I, my preference is uh, towards the interpupil focus. It does make it a little bit easier. Um, when you have to adjust things when your eyes are different. Um, fixed focus binoculars are not recommended uh, because this is a compromised design. Uh, the image quality will degrade rapidly as you use them outside the, their designed range. Obviously, they're set for a specific distance. Um, and um, you can't adjust them, and you can't, you can't adjust them if your eyes are slightly different. So um, so it's it's a cheap way of doing it, but it's it's not going to give you a, a good quality view. I was mentioning interpupil distance. So interpupil distance is the distance the uh, between the of the two eyepieces, and obviously everyone's head is different, and obviously um, you know children have a, a smaller distance between their eyes, uh, so it, it, you don't want a binocular that's going to be fixed, and you want to have a binocular that's going to have a reasonable range. So you can see here that I can bend the uh, binoculars in and out, two on the hinge, uh, to get the interview distance right for your eyes. And when you're viewing through, um, you want to just kind of merge that eye and start wider um, and then move them, move them in to get it right for my eyes. Um, and when you do that, what will happen is if you're looking at a star, um, 
the style, you know, the two images will kind of merge together and sort of form one combined image. Uh, and because of that, you do get a bit of a stereo effect in binoculars. It's kind of a pseudo stereo effect, but your brain is now seeing, rather with a telescope with one eye, your brain is now seeing uh, the uh, a dual image and it's interpreting that in stereo like in the daytime. Uh, so it's one of the kind of nice things about binoculars when you look at the sky, you kind of get a pseudo 3D effect um, sometimes as your brain is taking two images in. It's just, just, you know, just one uh, for that. So. Uh, another number to look at is the field of view. So um, the field of view, uh, so as I mentioned before, one of the great things about binoculars is that you look at that wide field of view. Uh, uh, now, for reference here, um, the full moon is about half a degree in diameter in the sky. So with a telescope, you tend to look at a single object at one time. Um, at low power, low magnification on a telescope, you might see up to one degree of sky or twice the size of the moon piece of sky at one time. At higher power, you could be looking at half the moon or piece of sky or even less. Um, so you see it's a very small field of view. With binoculars, you look at that wide field of view. So a pair of 10 by 50s, like our little ones here, uh, you're looking at you know, six to seven degrees of sky. So it's you know, 12 to 14 moons of diameter of sky. Uh, with the 25, 20 by 100, sorry, 20 by 80 binoculars behind me on the tripod there, uh, with those, you're looking at uh, still three and a quarter degrees of sky. It's over six moons wide. Uh, and with the giant big, uh, the 25 by 100 binoculars, with these, you're still seeing two and a half degrees or a five moon width field of view piece of sky. And that's what I find makes binoculars uh, really good for exploring the sky, good for browsing around, um, makes good for teaching, good for learning the sky. So that's one of the, well, I think it's one of their strengths. Um, now, a couple of technical uh, things to think about. Um, first one is eye relief. So eye relief is the distance that your eye needs to be from the eyepiece to get a clear view. Uh, so this is particularly important for people like me that wear glasses. And obviously, glasses get in the way, and um, you, you, know, you don't want your glasses bumping against the, the binocular eyepieces. Uh, people often ask me that when I'm using telescopes or binoculars, should I leave my glasses on or off? Um, and with binoculars, uh, you can actually choose uh, which way. I, I do it both ways, whichever is most comfortable for you, because you can focus binoculars for you and your eyes. Uh, but you want to have uh, binoculars that have a good eye relief. Uh, this means you can uh, place your eyes at a comfortable distance from the binoculars, rather than having your eyes up hard against these eyepieces. Um, now, longer focal lengths generally allow for longer eye reliefs. Um, uh, so, um, uh, so those big binoculars with their longer focal lengths, yeah, you know, to make it a little easier. But some of the uh, Binoculars, like our little 10 by 50s, actually have um, long IRL for eyepieces in them to make that more comfortable and easier. Uh, so I think find it, you know, it does a superior uh, you know, viewing experience, a much more enjoyable viewing experience. Um, a hint I give to people is when you're looking through your binoculars, is you don't have to hold the binoculars up hard against your eyes. You can actually just hold them back comfortably in front of your eyes, focus over your point there, and I actually find that's easier to merge the image and get a sharp, clear view uh, when browsing around, both daytime and nighttime. Uh, so consider eye relief. Uh, next technical one is the exit pupil. So the exit pupil uh, is the, um, so we've talked about how to explain it, how to measure it first. So binoculars uh, are concentrating the light down to a small beam that your eyes can see. So exactly the same as what the telescope's doing. You're taking a bigger piece of light and condensing it down to something the size your eyes can see. Um, I often explain, explain it as it's just like having a big eye. Uh, the um, exit pupil um, of the binoculars is calculated by taking the aperture of the binoculars and dividing that by the magnification. Um, and what you want is you want the this exit pupil to match up the pupil diameter in your eye to get the optimum view. If the exit pupil is too small, 
then light is being wasted. Um, the images, you know, it's not going to your, um, not all getting to, um, to your eye. Um, and so the image will appear dimmer. Basically, not all the light is getting through from the binoculars to your eye. Uh, for most people, um, their pupil size varies in the range uh, between about three millimeters in diameter in the um, daytime uh, and up to you know, six, maybe seven millimeters in diameter uh, at nighttime as your eye dilates. Um, and that, that can change person to person and tends to reduce down as you get older. Uh, so you want something that has an exit people in that sort of, you know, four to five, um, four to six uh, millimeter range uh, to uh, get the maximum optimum view out of, out of the binoculars. Uh, and yeah, light's not being wasted. Uh, now, let's look at um, collimation or alignment of the, of the binoculars. So uh, an important thing uh, with binoculars, like all optical instruments, uh, is collimation. If the two halves of the binoculars are not well aligned, then you won't see a sharp image. In fact, you know, misalignment you will cause you to see a double image. Um, so if you look at stars, every star will be doubled, and that's extremely frustrating. Um, also, this will cause discomfort, um, actual visual fatigue, uh, as your brain is kind of struggling to adjust to the view. Um, so misalignment of them can be caused by uh, either bad quality manufacture, uh, can be caused by binoculars being dropped or mistreated, um, and so the, the prisms or maybe even the lenses have actually moved out of alignment. Um, now, for a lot of cheaper binoculars, um, the components are actually glued in place. Um, you can't adjust them. So if, if you do drop them or you do damage their um, collimation, change their collimation, then um, your view is, is stuffed. You can't fix it. Um, they become throwaways. Uh, but a good pair of binoculars can actually be adjusted. Um, there are adjustment um, screws in them, and the prisms can actually be aligned back again. Um, if it's not something if you're not comfortable doing yourself, don't do. Um, talk to your supplier, talk to your local astronomical society, find people around that can help you with that and checking your binocular collimation out. Uh, but you want them so that you get nice, sharp um, stars and um, you know, single stars. No, you don't want double images of things. Uh, something that um, people often ask me is, are your binoculars waterproof? Uh, so waterproofing can be defined, kind of defined in several ways. Um, there are military and marine spec binoculars uh, out in the market, and these are designed uh, for those rough conditions, for those rough applications. Um, they're more expensive um, for that, and um, they're also a lot more you know, bulky and cumbersome because of the big houses they put them in to protect them from those conditions. Um, yeah, basically you wanna make them drop proof and, and um, bath proof. Now, for most binoculars, the everyday binoculars, like we saw here, here today, um, and um, you see in the market, um, in the modern binoculars, waterproofing is um, defined and based around an airtight seal. Um, so while you wouldn't necessarily take um, you know, average proof binoculars for a swim or a bath, uh, but they're watertight from rain showers and humidity, uh, yeah, everyday use uh, for that. So uh, when you see um, binoculars described as waterproof, that's, that's what it means, is they're uh, sealed airtight. Um, so moisture cannot get inside the lenses. Um, and, and some of the older binoculars, where it's happened, where you guys get in, you'll see that they fog up and, and uh, make them uh, you know, unusable inside as that, from that moisture. So, uh, so that's a, a few comments on the features to kind of look at and look for uh, when um, yeah, looking at binoculars, um, because the big one is the aperture. Uh, get that right, get a magnification level that's suitable for you. Um, make sure you're getting you know, the maximum sort of uh, full aperture of the binoculars, whatever the real aperture of the binoculars is, not just the lens size. Uh, and then something that depends on what you're using it for. So for some applications, for some users, uh, the um, yeah, a, a small pair of handheld binoculars like the 10 by 50s or even the 15 by 70s are actually better and more suitable for using a giant pair of binoculars um, because they're easily portable um, and holdable and grab and take them out. Um, uh, and you want to look at that big wide field of view. Uh, for example, daytime use, bird watching, wide field of view is better because birds move and animals move uh, quite fast. Whereas a big pair of binoculars, the field of view might be a bit more cumbersome. Uh, 
and, and you consider those things like the eye relief, the exit pupil, um, and you know, good quality uh, lens and optics inside with the, and remember you want something that's fully multi-coated. Um, so to accentuate all that and to um, tease you a little bit, we'll take a little bit of eye candy. And behind me, just right behind me here on the tripod is a pair of binocular telescopes. So I'll take these off, give you a closer look. So these, these take things to uh, kind of a whole new level. I can see those well there. Um, so these, these binocular telescopes are actually 100 mil aperture, so 100 mil lenses at the front there. And they operate on the same principles and design as the binoculars we talked about before, having prism-based systems inside um, to extend the focal length out and extend the light path. Uh, but these ones take it to a whole new level. So what they do is by um, basically they are twin high-end refracted telescopes. And um, but what they do is uh, they use very high-end optics. And for the, in the manufacturer, they use what's called extra dispersion or ED glass in them. And that um, ED glass takes out all the aberrations that you can see. So it gives you a stunning kind of clear and sharp view. And any aberrations are virtually unseeable uh, with these. So a um, few of the nice things about them, they actually have a 45 degree uh, diagonals on the end. And you'll notice they actually have full eyepieces in. So with these ones, you can actually take the eyepieces out and change onto different eyepieces. Uh, so you can change the magnification view if you want to. Um, and because this, you can bump magnification up. But even with these ones, uh, currently these eyepieces I have at the moment give a uh, 40 times magnification, so quite high power for binoculars. Um, but they're still giving an almost two degree field of view. Maybe it's four times the moon uh, piece of sky. Um, and it makes it great viewing. Uh, these are now one of my favourite tools for viewing the night sky, and they're still very portable um, to get out. Uh, so, in summary, uh, binoculars allow you to have a wide-angle, low magnification view. They're very flexible, uh, as you can use them for both viewing the night sky and for daytime views. Um, as the image is the right way up, um, yeah, you can use them both ways. Uh, being compact and lightweight makes them extremely portable, uh, but it's important to get those good quality optics uh, to get the best views. Um, I recommend, I always recommend, even with telescopes, but binoculars as well. If you're not sure, try, try some different ones out. Get to a place where you can try the binoculars out um, and work out which is the best size for you, compare between them, look at the different views and assess the quality of them. And now you've got some tips of what sort of features to look for with them. Um, for astronomy, uh, this makes binoculars superb for learning and browsing the night sky. So I hope you enjoy your binocular viewing. So I'll put this one back on the tripod. And what I'll do is sort of finish off um, before we get on to some general questions is um, take a look, kind of do a little explore and a look at uh, the sort of things you can, you're going to see in uh, binoculars. So what I'm going to do is share onto my screen um, a program called Starry Night. And Starry Night is just a night sky software. Um, there are many uh, versions around of different sorts of software. Uh, one of the popular ones recommended to people is called Stellarium. Um, Stellarium is great because it's um, open source, so it's free, and it's a powerful tool for seeing what's in the night sky at the moment. And with a number of these astronomy software, is um, as you can see, you'll see on the middle of the screen there are um, there three circles. And so on this software, I can simulate the field of view of what the binoculars or telescope is going to be looking at to give you an idea of comparison. And so I'll show you a few things to. Um, uh, to see yeah, what it's like in your peel and why some of those binoculars are better. So that's that. So, um, so what to look at? Well, first thing with any optical, when you get a new optical instrument, is take a look at the moon. Um, so the moon is going to provide you um, with several things. First of all, easy to find. Um, moon gives you a great object to practice using, so you're getting practice pointing and getting this lined up and to practice your focusing. You can tell we've got a nice sharp crater on the moon and a sharp image to get the focus right. Uh, when you look at the sky, you essentially look at infinity focus. Um, 
you'll be amazed at just the sort of detail, even a, in the kind of uh, pair of small handheld binoculars, the sort of detail you can see in the moon, all the craters. Um, and remember, the best time to look at the moon is actually not when it's full. The best time to look at it when it's in phase. Um, so like a first quarter moon or a little crescent moon. You see all the crater details along the edge. Uh, you know, you'll be amazed at what you can see in you know, even in binoculars of the moon. Um, I find some of the best objects to look at in binoculars uh, are large clusters. Um, and um, and some of the brighter deep objects. Um, when I'm teaching people the sky, it's a fun way to, to, to do it using binoculars because you can, um, you know, or we have binoculars each and hunt around. You learn where things are compared to other parts of the sky. Um, and so with that wide field of view, you can really see the objects in the sky in context. Um, uh, in fact, some of the large clusters are uh, actually a better view of binoculars um, or a small telescope than you can actually see in a big telescope because you, you can see the whole cluster at once. Some of these clusters are quite big. And in a big telescope, you can't fit the whole cluster in at one time. So let's start off here. So this particular view we're looking at is uh, at the moment, it's right after sunset, um, looking low in the northwestern sky. Um, this is more of a summer sky. There a summer sky up high. You might be see Orion. There's the, the often called the pot in New Zealand. Uh, there are the four stars bounding Orion. And um, coming down below into Taurus, uh, the V shape there is the head of Taurus the bull, and down below that is a very famous popular group of um, cluster of stars, uh, is often called Matariki, uh, around the world it's the Pleiades, the Pleiades cluster, or, um, and also astronomers use a catalog name Messier 45, M45. Also nicknamed the Seven Sisters from the uh, Roman and um, Now on screen here, uh, you'll see three circles. The big circle is a pair of our Astron's 10 by 50 binoculars, those little handheld ones. Um, the uh, middle circle here, the big smaller yellow circle, is that is the um, 20 by 80 binoculars. So that's looking at uh, just over three degrees of sky. Uh, and so you see that full cluster. Whereas the um, middle circle, the red one there, is actually a telescope eyepiece. We're a telescope eyepiece size. So if I um, zoom too far, it's uh, so you can see with the clusters, it's actually quite a big cluster. And if you're looking through your telescope, um, you wouldn't actually see the uh, full cluster in the field of view. Whereas in binoculars, you can see the full cluster. Um, and in the small binoculars, you can see the whole region of the sky. Um, so it's a good example of where um, it's actually better in binoculars than through a larger telescope. Uh, so if you want to look at, so if you're out um, in the very early evening, you might get a last glimpse of uh, this object now, but it's getting pretty low in the sky. Um, but we will have it appearing in the uh, pre-dawn sky um, in a couple of months in um, late uh, June. And of course, that New Zealand marks, marks Matariki. Matariki is the, um, uh, is the marks the Murray New Year, and the cluster of stars is the um, object we look forward to mark that when we first set rising in the pre-dawn sky. Uh, so let's click over to a, a different screen and uh, what we're looking at here is um, uh, our southern skies. And I'll set it for about eight o'clock uh, tonight, so in the mid-evening. Uh, those of you familiar with the sky, we are looking towards the south. Uh, in the zoomed out view, you'll see that the two pointers here, the southern cross uh, and um, higher up in the sky into the false cross this way. Uh, this is one of my favourite parts of the sky to look at because there are many objects to browse around here. And also, I, you know, get a little bit over to the, the southwestern side of the sky, you can see the large and the small midnight clouds. Those are our nearest galaxies. Um, again, actually, just as good, not better in binoculars than a telescope. So let's go over to the large cloud and then we'll zoom in. So, uh, best seen from outside the city lights in a dark, darker sky. Um, uh, but you can see here, so what it looks like in binoculars, you get this kind of cigar shaped big smudge. Um, remember, colour comes generally comes from uh, long exposure photographs. So, with your eye, it looks more black and white. Uh, but you can see here, to see the whole um, galaxy, you actually need the low powered um, 10 by 50 binoculars. Um, the 
20 by 80s, can't, can't see most of it, but it's filling up the whole field of view. And actually, if you look at one end of this, uh, what will be a, you know, a big kind of smudge across your uh, eyepiece, big bright smudge, um, you can see there's a kind of big knob at one end, which is actually the tarantial nebula. Uh, and as I like to point out to people, uh, the tarantial nebula is bright enough that you can see it binoculars, even though it is in a different galaxy. In fact, it's the only nebula you can see in another galaxy in binoculars. Um, so that's a nice thing. That's high at the moment in the sky. So that's always a fun target to find. You know, look at that big fuzzy smudge of the small, of the large magnetic cloud. It's a name because it looks like a small cloud in, this, in a dark country sky. Uh, and look for the knob in the tarantula. So we zoom back out again. We're going to zoom over to the Southern Cross. There are the two pointers and the Southern Cross. And we're going to look at the piece of sky the Milky Way runs through here, up above the Southern Cross. Um, and look at the clusters, actually, you'll see the jewel box cluster being marked there below. Um, and up above it is a nice one of my favourite clusters here. It's, it's called um, NGC 3532. It's a very sexy catalogue name, but it's, um, it does have some common names as well. Um, and um, and this is a great cluster in binoculars. Um, it actually is uh, occupying, the full cluster occupies, well, I'm we're getting close to the full degree of sky. So you can see if you're looking through your um, telescope eyepiece, you can't get the whole cluster into the field of view. But when you look at through the binoculars, you can get that cluster into the field of view um, quite nicely. Um, for those that know this part of the sky, because the Edocrina is very nearby, the Edocrina nebula, um, and there are many more clusters nearby. There's just one another cluster just above the other side. Um, this is a great object for um, uh, to look at with, with kids because it's, it's a bright, big, big bright group of hundreds of bright stars, and one's my favourite. Um, also high at the moment, if I zoom back out, uh, you can see up high is the uh, false cross. For those that know the sky, these four stars mark the false cross. If you take the long axis of the false cross where it points to, you can see there's another cluster here called NGC 2516, um, another exciting catalogue name. Uh, but if we zoom in, it's another bright cluster of a couple of hundred bright stars. Um, you can see in telescope, fills the entire telescope, almost overwhelms it, but in binoculars, yeah, you can see the whole region around it and get it a bit more in context. So you can see quite nicely, and you know, you'll see like 50 bright stars, 50, 60 bright stars in binoculars in the sky. And if you explore this part of the Milky Way right through, uh, you know, from the False Cross down through the Sun Cross, you know, there are many more of these clusters to look at. Um, it's, yeah, it's a very rich part of the sky. I'm going to zoom out a little bit further and advance in time a little bit. Uh, so we're going to move, move around to the uh, eastern sky. And I'm going to go forward in time to say 10 o'clock uh, in the sky. So, well, actually, 11 o'clock now. I'm to do it. So, I'm sorry. Let's go forward to uh, 10 o'clock. And you can see rising in our eastern sky at that time now is our winter sky. Winter is, winter is coming, unfortunately. And but it just gives us a nice view of the Milky Way. And those, again, that know the sky here, you can see Scorpius, right? There's the Scorpion's tail. This way, Antares, uh, the right register to Antares, and the Scorp three star of the Scorpion's head. Um, this is also Tiki and Maui, um, the, the Maui's hook, which you fished up the North Island with. And you might be able to see in the background there, you see the thick bit of the Milky Way going through. Again, there are some nice bright clusters here to look at. Um, and uh, both around the Scorpion's tail, look around, but if you come right around off the end of the tail, let me zoom in a bit more. Uh, two more messy objects, M6 and M7, and basically they're just, there's the end of the tail coming around, and they are uh, just off the bottom here. So if I, uh, I'll mark that, M Messier 7, uh, and I'll centre it for us. And this is another one of these classic, um, it's, this open cluster is quite close to us. It's, I think it's from memory, it's only around uh, oh, several hundred light years away. Um, I think it's probably around 800, 900 light years away. Uh, but uh, you can see it occupies about, about 80 bright stars. 
and in your uh, telescope, it overwhelms the field of view. But in your binoculars, uh, you actually get the whole cluster in it. It's very nice. And if you look to the left up there, you'll see there's another cluster very similar, and this is Mesia 6, um, the butterfly cluster. The same sort of effect in there. So you have two very bright, um, wide field open clusters um, and to look at. And so you've got a nice view of you know, three binoculars of this nice cluster of stars in the middle. So I think it's about 1,800 bright stars in the cluster. Easy to find uh, because I just pull out the scorpion's tail. There's the end of the scorpion's tail that way. So, yeah, that part of the Milky Way, again, very rich, explore it um, and the side. So, uh, so that's a couple of objects to, I like looking at through binoculars, so, you know, classic sort of things that are, you know, give you superb views and good for practicing learning the sky uh, for that. So, um, so I hope that gave you some interesting um, things to look at. Um, as you may have guessed, all the uh, binoculars we'll be looking at tonight are all part of the Astron's um, stock. We have them available um, in our standard range, and you can look on the Astron's website for um, astrons.nz for more information um, about those and the technical specs, or feel free to give me a, uh, contact me to ask questions about that. Um, and the good news, we've seen the news today that uh, as we change back to level three next week, we'll be able to start resuming shipping them as well. Uh, so, uh, so if you're stuck in your bubble and want to do some things at night time, look at the night sky, binoculars are a great way to get started for that. Nice, inexpensive, easy way to get started for browsing around the night sky. Uh, so, the question is, has um, anyone got any questions? Yeah, we do have some questions. Thanks for that, Andrew. That was a really good presentation. Um, I certainly enjoyed it. Um, the, our first question you've actually just about answered, but you might want to um, possibly go back and, uh, and and show some of your um, some of your Stellarium or um, Starry Night rather. Um, the first question was from MSRB1981, who says uh, they have uh, Celestron 20 by 80 Pro binoculars and wants to know which nebula and deep space objects uh, that they can see with it. So you went through that quite in depth, but I thought it'd be quite useful. You've got the the yellow rings on the and yeah. one of those would have been about the same field of view as yeah. the Celestron. The 21. So I'll share, I'll share that screen back again, back to uh, Starry Night. Uh, so, uh, so probably, yeah. You know, the first thing I said, the first thing I started off is obviously the moon. Um, a pair of big markers like that, you may even look at, um, if you're up late at the moment, uh, around midnight, you might see Jupiter rising up in the uh, eastern skies. You might see Jupiter's moons through the um, binoculars. Jupiter will be very small, but you'll see a little, little tiny planet with some moons um, next to it. Uh, but what I would do is explore the Milky Way. Um, so the Milky Way, we'll zoom right back out again. Um, and, and yeah, it's a room. I'll zoom right back out um, to get a wide field of view. And the Milky Way now, and this, this is one of my favorite times here to look at the Milky Way um, through the late autumn um, because it's, it's Milky Way's been nice and high and also. Um, it's still warm. It's not too cold outside. Um, you know, middle of winter gets some cool, crisp, clear nights, um, but it can be you know close to freezing outside, literally. So I would browse through the, just with your binoculars. Um, if you have got a fitting for a camera tripod, there are adapters available for that. Um, sometimes with those bigger binoculars, it can be easier to put them onto a tripod just for stability. But other times, I've also just put a blanket down the ground and kind of lie on the ground with the binocular on top of me to balance it. Um, and I find with the bigger ones, it's easy to hold them up near the objective ends because um, that's where the weight of the binoculars is to get a good balance. Uh, but just browse through this whole part of the sky all the way from the, so I'd probably, you know, if you find the Southern Cross, point the Southern Cross, go above that into this part of the Milky Way here. It's full of clusters. Uh, you're going to hit someone, get a program like Stellaria or Starlight here and so you can work out what you're actually looking at. Uh, and then later in the evening, as Scorpius is rising and the winter Milky Way is rising, then you go down below the, milk, the Southern Cross into the clusters down this way. Again, another very rich part of the sky. Uh, uh, so you can see if I zoom back in, um, I'll center on Eta Carina. Um, yeah, Eta Carina itself, you'll see uh, this particular software kind of overlays some photos in, which doesn't show up pretty well. But, if you look in this um, field of view, um, 
you can see in the big circle for your hand, little binoculars, I can actually see several objects here. There's, um, there's, there's something like that's probably a little bit faint for, but that's too faint for binoculars. But you're seeing the big cluster here um, with the Eddie Carini, like the key, actually see a bit nebul the nebulosity here, the nebulosity would be like a big faint cloud, um, and with a bright star in the middle of it, and actually a small open cluster in the middle of that as well. And there's another cluster here, 3293. Three, three, another quite nice open cluster, reasonably bright. Um, so you see that like one piece of sky, you just kind of go you know, in your binoculars, we look at the small yellow circle here, you go to the object and browse to here, and you can browse, then you'll see different objects. Um, so, yeah, with, with that, those binoculars, you've probably got around a three degree uh, field of view. So it's, it's you know, quite a substantial size. Thanks for that one, Andrew. Um, we've got another question from Raul's8469, who asks, does the finder scope on a telescope perform the same function as binoculars? Um, for the small ones, essentially, uh, the most, co probably most common finder scope you get on a binocular, on a telescope is an 8x50, or that's a range. Some of the smaller ones have small, smaller ones. But basically, they, they're just you know, a monocular. You know, it, the fine scope is just one half of a binocular. Um, it's, it's also why binoculars like like the um, uh, the little what, 10 by 50s here um, will actually give you a very similar view to your finder scope. Uh, so that's what makes them good for uh, learning the night sky because you can lie back on the on the deck chair or your uh, blanket, browse around the sky. Look for the fuzzy blobs or the yeah little groups of stars that are interesting, and say, oh, where is that group of stars? Oh, it's it's just between these two bright stars, or next to that bright star, or somewhere. Yeah, work out how you find it. Then use the your finder, your telescope to find the object for your telescope, because um, because your view is going to be very similar. And then put your telescope on it, and, and your telescope then resolve it out into more detail. So um, yeah, the, the small kind of handheld binoculars do give that very similar view to your your finder scope on your um, uh, telescope. Probably these ones have a slightly longer focal length, and uh, yeah, the minor differences uh, to do that. But yeah, a similar view for, for practice. Here. And the last question I've got on here is actually almost probably more a question for me than it is a question for you, and that's from um, Tracy Richards. There's been some great um, chat on the on the live chat actually. So this question's kind of got answered, but there's a few answers, so I'll answer it fully. Um, let me see if I can turn on my video. Unfortunately, my screen's going to be the view of me is going to be quite small. Uh, or look slightly lower quality. Um, so the question from Tracy is that um, she says, I have a set of 20 by 80 Astron's binoculars that has a small wheel with a Phillips screw head between the two viewing eyepieces. What's that wheel for? I have an idea, but wish for confirmation. So there's a little bit of chat on there. So I can I can show you that if I just fade into my video. Um, I got a, this is a pair of 25 by 100s, so, um, but they are pretty much the same. And I believe no, what you're talking about same. Um, Tracy is this little wheel in the middle there and it's got numbers on it hopefully you can see that um, so yeah so that wheel as, as was mentioned by uh, John McGowan in the chat that's to help you set your interpupillary distance so that's the distance between the two eyepieces to match that up with your eyes the numbers on that scale are a rough guide to the distance in millimeters um, for your eyes so um, uh, I wouldn't say that it was completely accurate, but what it is is a good guide. If you're going to be adjusting it for a few different viewers, you can get that adjusted, or at least you can remember the, um, the, the distance which is most comfortable for you. And that's where you can resolve the uh, images and that they don't split. Uh, when, when you're looking at stars, they look like a car, a single star. So hopefully, uh, Tracy says that that's what she was talking about, so that's great. So hopefully that answers your question for that one. So any I'll more make, questions? I'll just oh, sorry, interrupt you, Steve. The, um, I, on, just hope if you hold those binoculars back up again, um, onto the focuser, um, side on. Oh, yeah. You'll see, you'll, um, you'll see there's also numbers on the dials around where you, on individual focus um, focuses there. You can actually see the numbers around the side as well. And that's a handy tool in the Astros binoculars because um, obviously, you, when you use them just yourself, you can set them for your particular eyes, and you know what the setting is on the numbers for your particular eyes, and you get it right for there. But of course, if someone else comes along and borrows the binoculars and changes them, you go, oh, now I've got to refocus them for me. But if you can remember what settings are for your eyes, it gives you a really quick, easy way to set back to you know, the, you know, good focus for your eyes, and do the whole focus routine again. Um, it's, 
I mentioned before, it's a little bit, when you're used to a telescope, I found it a little bit trickier with the big binoculars getting used to focusing both eyes because I was so used, you know, for 25, 30 years, I've used one eye for looking at the sky. And so I had to retrain myself to use both eyes and merge them together. And so by doing that way, just a quick focus, it makes it much easier with those settings on there. Yeah. And you'll also notice uh, on the bottom, there's a line there, so you can set the, the zero on there. So yeah, so that's the diopter adjustment, which is one of the other things that was talked about in the chat. So it's fantastic that our other viewers are helping us with, with our questions. Um, any more questions? We do have time for one or two more if there's any quickly. Other than that, I have one question and I've heard a rumor and I haven't seen this myself because I've been locked down to my house that Astrons might have got some new products in and I'm really keen to see them on the Steve live see, stream. Steve wants to see the new toys. Why not? Why not? Um, I did put a post up um, over the uh, weekend um, and there'll be more information coming on the, on the Astrons website this week. Um, but yes, so we're always looking, for, um, actually, so we've got people here, we are always looking for new products and new suppliers. Um, if you have ideas, always feel free to contact us of what sort of things you're looking for. Um, our preference is often to try and buy them direct and, and get good qualities, um, uh, uh, yeah, goods and equipment into New Zealand um, direct from the manufacturers. So um, it's, um, and by knowing what you want, it helps us, you know, when we're looking around uh, and talking to different suppliers out there. Um, so. We've been talking lots today about looking at the night sky, but of course there's a whole other half of the 24-hour period. Look at so um, I'll go behind me and come back, and just recently, and I would say it's been limited because of the lockdown. We've just received our first shipment of solar telescopes. So um, a couple of different ways you can do solar viewing. Um, Probably most people most familiar with is standard with a white light sort of um, uh, uh, the um, basic solar filters. And these are, you often see the solar glasses, um, they've been used for like clipped glass and things like that. And um, and what they're doing is basically taking out 99% of, 99.9% of the light and all the ultraviolet, uh, the harmful ultraviolet part of light. Um, and you get a, a bright white image of the um, sun. And good for looking at sunspots um, and uh, things bright light, things like that with the sun. Um, and often, if you ever get to see a solar eclipse, which I highly recommend, um, then you will, um, yeah, good for viewing those, a safe way of viewing those. It's a safe way of viewing the sun. However, for the serious solar observers, it gets a bit more complicated. So what this telescope it has, it's actually a standard refractor telescope, uh, but at the end, it has a very specialised um, H, oh, it's hydrogen alpha, H alpha, uh, solar filter, um, and put that down for a second. I'm going to drop it. I'll be down to down. To down. Uh, that's the filter itself, uh, which goes in this, this particular version of the filter. It can actually go onto a standard uh, telescope, you can go onto, onto your own telescope to use it. Um, and um, and that's the the very expensive part of it. Um, it's tuned, and um, this one's actually it's temperature controlled, and um, it looks at, at the hydrogen alpha, a very, very narrow part of the uh, spectrum. And then um, by doing that, um, we can make a safe look at the sun because we're filtering out all the harmful part of the uh, sun's frequencies uh, and look at a very, very narrow, yeah, fainter image of it. Uh, what you can then see is you can see the sunspots in a lot more detail. This is the sort of image you see, like you see in photographs of the sun. Um, and um, then you also, um, can see things like prominence in the sun, the big flares coming out of the sun itself. Um, and I was fortunate enough to get a fine day which I was tested out um, and have a nice look at the sun and um, sometimes it'll look quiet, but it's, um, it's uh, I'll hopefully get some more chance to try that and we'll get to a chance to demonstration um, this more this in the near future. Um, so if, if you are interested in solar viewing, get in contact with us because we're just, uh, this is our initial shipment down, um, but we're also looking at expanding the range. Um, this particular company is um, Daystar, Daystar filters in America, um, and um, we, we work with them to uh, have more um, a bigger range of filters uh, down out of them. So, um, so I think I think um, as soon as the lockdown finishes, we might have a little visit from you, Steve. Yep, I think I think you will. <laughs> so yeah, so uh, so that, yeah, this this particular one is eighty mil um, aperture, um, and the other one I've got is a sixteen mil aperture one. Um, 
And of course, for the sun, the sun's big and bright. You don't need a big telescope to look at the sun. So that's why you only need the small aperture um, scopes. And I think we just got one final question that's just squeezed in there from John McGowan, um, who would like you to um, just have a have a chat about how do you detect if there are undersized prisms in your binoculars, or how do you know if you've got undersized prisms in your binoculars? That's a good question. Um, I'm actually not sure. Um, I was fortunate enough that um, um, when I was when I made a visit to um, our factory, the, factory, the manufacturer of binoculars for us, um, they were able to show me the difference, and something I'd never heard of before, and they were able to educate me on that. Um, I've never oh, I can actually... I can probably give a go give a go. Yeah, go. I mean, I've, why, the only way I've done it here is is I've actually had you know I've done it with twenty by eighty binoculars and I had a had a undersized prism one and a um and a and a full size prism one side by side and you you could just easily even even without any um, expertise you could tell the difference in the quality of the images and the, and the detail you could see um, it was just easy to tell the difference but I don't know actually by looking through itself how you tell I can. Um, when I see pictures of them online and stuff, I can tell often um, look at the barrel sizes um, where the prisms are at this end. It's it's often narrower uh, in the mountings at this end. Um, so sometimes it's obvious when you, when you can, again, it's easy when you're comparing side by side of which models and there's, there's various difference. What it actually is often is, it's just generations of design and technology. So the, the cheaper design is a 20 year old design, whereas the um, the better design is a you know, five year old design or a you know, three or four year old design. Um, as they improve them, but it's just they can um, make the, the old design cheaper. Um, so it's, um, but anything you can add, Steve, is... Um, yeah, I, I think probably ask the difficult questions of your supplier, really. Um, so I think most, as Andrew said earlier, uh, the reason that, that this is done is for two reasons. It's uh, it's hard to make um, lenses that are perfect in optical quality all the way to the edges. Um, so often by um, using a smaller prism size, what you get is you get a smallest pair of binoculars that's lighter, but you're also not getting the chromatic aberrations to the edge of the glass, which is why a lot of manufacturers will do that. And it makes a, a lighter, smaller perhaps a little bit more cost-effective um, binocular. But you should be able to ask your supplier who may not know directly. Uh, they may have to go back to the manufacturer to ask the question. It's quite common um, that they are slightly undersized. And the big thing is, is, is try them out. As Andrew said, I would really recommend any supplier really should... Um, give you the opportunity to try these out and if you can try them out at night uh even better and just just see how they work for you and see see how they they work for your your viewing um couple more questions that have just come through actually um well just one really um talking about stereo binocular viewers for telescopes uh kai and seymour wants to know do you think they're better than using a single eyepiece um Yes and no. I've, I've had various. Um, we actually um, had had some um, down which we tried. One of our um, customers, who's a, a very um, experienced observer, uh, was testing them for us, um, and we had, we had some some down. And um, yes, you, what you do, I do believe they're a little bit tricky to use, and it's trickier because of the interpeople distance. Size. When you're having groups of people using them, obviously everyone has a slightly different um, interpeople distance, so that makes it harder for people. Um, uh, for a for a group, but um, if and sometimes they're trickier to get them working. It just depends on your telescope configuration. It depends on the model of telescope you have, whether they'll get to focus properly. So you've got to consider that. Um, but um, what happens is just like binoculars, although it is is a mono image coming through the system from your telescope, um, what happens is your brain gets tricked is into seeing the stereo image, and it it creates a pseudo three D effect um, of the uh, object you're looking at. So, in the fact that it's open clusters um, get that effect, and planets can get that effect as well. So, you get a kind of pseudo 3D effect as you're, because your brain's seeing two images and it's putting those together. Um, so, um, definitely people say nice things about them, and, and if you get them right and get good quality ones. But again, it's just, just like all the optics, if, if you haven't got good quality ones, then um, it's, it's putting more pieces of glass in the systems, there's more potential for light scattering and, and aberrations. So, um, so get good quality optics ones. Um, we, it's something we we're looking at. The factory we used for our ones is um, was redesigning their ones, and uh, hopefully, new generation is going to come out this year. Um, and we'll look at adding those into our product range this year. But it's um, uh, but yeah, for the right combination of, of telescope, it's um, 
can give a, 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 a different, it does give a slightly different view. And um, yeah, so yeah, people do like them. Thanks very much for that, Andrew. Um, I think that's all for our questions. And thanks for the really interesting talk. Uh, you're welcome. And thanks, yeah, thanks for joining us this evening from everywhere wherever you are in the world. Um, hopefully you, you in, um, get to enjoy your lockdown and get out and since you don't have to get up early in the morning to go to work, we can enjoy the night sky and get some fine nights. So enjoy your binocular telescope viewing and telescope viewing.